Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl podcast. This is episode 12, The Beaches of Normandy. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to visit the beaches of Normandy with Liberation Route Europe, a nonprofit organization dedicated to honoring and educating the world about the Allied liberation of Europe during World War II. On this trip, I visited the beaches of Normandy. Before getting there, my brain couldn't understand the monumental feat that went into the D-Day invasion and the amazing sacrifices that Allied soldiers undertook to make the invasion successful. My guest today is Yori Brinchens, a historian with Liberation Route Europe. We discussed the events leading up to the D-Day invasion, what it was like to be a soldier on the beaches on D-Day, and how Europeans on the ground experienced the liberation. At the end of this episode, find out how to enter this week's contest. My guest today is Yori Brinchens. He is a historian for Liberation Route Europe. Hi, Yori. Hello. How did you get interested in the liberation of Europe? Because I guess as an American, I have a very strong interest in World War II. I know lots of Americans do. And it surprised me when I was traveling with Liberation Route Europe. And every time I would meet somebody associated with the organization, especially if they were Dutch, the passion that the Dutch nation has for the allied troops. And it's, it was just really touching. So how did this become your focus for your work? I'm not actually sure, to be honest. <laughs> People have asked me the same question uh, uh, quite a few times before. And the, the only answer I really have is that since I can remember, I've had a really strong interest in history in general. So in high school, it was one of the, the only subjects I actually enjoyed going to. And from there, I decided to go to university, study history. Uh, My expertise is actually Roman and medieval history, if you go from uh, what I've been told in uh, university. But this is uh, really a hobby that's gotten uh, really out of hand by now. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, not really sure where it came from, but I'm always fascinated by uh, especially the history of the Second World War. So why don't we talk a little bit about where Normandy is, because people might not know where in France it is. So where is Normandy? Normandy is on the, the west coast of France, and it's sort of in the, the, the upper northern part of France. And why is this such an important place in French history, and especially in French and English history? Normandy, the Pas de Calais, that, the, the entire channel actually between France and England, it's been uh, the scene of so many iconic pieces of history. In medieval times, uh, William the Conqueror crossed from France uh, to England during the Hundred Years' War. There's been a constant uh, flow of people from England to France. If you're in England and there's a way to go to France, you have to go through the Channel. The easiest place to do it at, distance-wise, is at Calais. But essentially, the entire Channel is the connection between England and France. Let's talk a little bit about what Normandy was like before the war. Normandy has its own distinct culture that's kind of different from France anyway because of the history with the English and the Vikings, etc. So just give us a couple sentences. What was Normandy like before all of this happened? Well, uh, as you said, because of its history in medieval times with the, the invasions of the Vikings, because of its history in the medieval period with the Hundred Years' Wars, Normandy uh, has a very rich history, but prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, it was not really too different from any other part you could find in France. Of course, there are regional differences that do occur, but most of the people uh, were farmers with a bit of industry near the larger cities. Uh, Of course, it being an area of France that is located on the shore, it also has uh, fishing industry and trade, but essentially it's not really too different from other uh, locations you might think of in France. So when the Nazis occupied it, what was life like in Normandy under Nazi occupation? Because it was a little different than what it was like in Paris or Vichy, France. Essentially, there's a big distinction if you're in France between the occupied part and Vichy, France, the part that collaborated with the, the Nazi German government. But in Normandy, 
basically the same rules would apply as to all the other parts of occupied France. So um, there were strict limitations on what, for instance, Jews could do. Uh, Jews had to wear their uh, Star of David to make sure that they were recognized as being Jews. The local population would have encountered some uh, measures from the, the government. At first, those wouldn't have been too uh, far-reaching, but as the war progressed, and especially as the invasion seemed to approach, all those restrictive uh, measures were uh, going a bit further, so that there was no way the population could contact the, the allies to help them. That was very restricted in that sense. So they tried to restrict the local population in that they couldn't be part of the resistance movement. If you were caught as a member of the resistance, that had dire consequences, of course. Basically, that was live under occupation. So on the eve of the invasion of Normandy, what's happening with the Allied forces? Why are they picking this spot? And what was the preparation for the Normandy invasion like? Wow, the preparation for the the Normandy invasions must have been one of the most biggest preparations you can ever imagine in in any war, essentially. Over a million people were assembled in uh, the southern part of England. Large-scale decoy actions were set up to have Nazis convinced that the Allies would actually land elsewhere, perhaps on the Dutch coasts or even uh, in Scandinavian coast or in Central Europe via the Mediterranean. The the, the preparations are completely beyond uh, any imagination. It's such a large-scale undertaking absolutely incredible. And to answer the first question, uh, the reason why they chose Normandy as a location to land is because of several factors. The Normandy coastline is somewhat sheltered from the worst weather. It forms a natural bay with the Cotentin Peninsula on uh, one side. It's within fighter cover of English airfields. So if you have a landing, uh, the fighter planes that are stationed in the, the southernmost part of England are capable of covering uh, the landing areas, which was, which was absolutely vital. And it isn't too far away from England. A last factor I think uh, worthwhile mentioning is that the German defenses of Normandy were far less complete than, for instance, at the Pas de Calais. So uh, the, the obstacles they would have to overcome on the beaches were uh, not the heaviest that you could find along the shoreline. Why was that? Why, why were the Nazis concentrating their forces at Calais? Calais is the obvious spot you would choose if you were to do an amphibious landing. It's the shortest distance from Britain at Dover, so um, there's still a ferry line between the two places to to illustrate that. It's really a convenient place to cross. The fighter cover that the Allies could provide would have the largest depth because it was the closest, so uh, they could strike further inland. The big reason not to go there is that the German defenses of Calais, for those obvious reasons, were... They had achieved the highest level of any location on the Atlantic Wall, so the the German shoreline defense. Calais was the most heavily fortified location. And uh, the country just behind Calais is also not really convenient if you want to strike towards Germany quickly. There's a lot of rivers, canals, stuff like that, that would impede any invasion force. So therefore, they chose Normandy over Calais. And when they chose Normandy, what was it like on the ground? Who from the Nazis was in charge and what kind of work were they doing to prepare? That's a really interesting question. The, one of the main issues ha- that the Germans had was that there was essentially no one in overall command or at least three people who were responsible. And that made for a very difficult situation. The person who was supposed to be in overall command was uh, Gerd von Rundstedt. He was the the German commander of all the forces in the West. Under him was uh, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the the Field Marshal who made his name in uh, Northern Africa. He was given the job of inspecting the shoreline defenses, and he was put in charge of Army Group B. And then there was Geo von Schwettenberg, who was in command of Panzergruppe West, which was the largest armored force in France. And then there was still an armored reserve that was under the direct control of Adolf Hitler. So essentially, uh, four people trying to do the same job, and none of them were quite all in line which, uh, with what needed to happen to, uh, to counter the invasion. On the Allied side, who was in charge? General Eisenhower. Yeah, these are the names everyone knows, but who was in charge and what were they actually doing behind the scenes? General Eisenhower was in overall command of the invasion, so he had the, the job of 
making sure that the invasion would go smoothly. Uh, that entailed um, giving directions to his subordinates. Uh, the important, most important of those were um, Bernard Montgomery, the British uh, commander. He was made the uh, overall land forces commander for the first period of the invasion. Later on, Eisenhower would take that job himself. There was the British Admiral Ramsey, who was uh, responsible for the naval part of uh, the Normandy campaign. And the U.S., I think, no, he was British, actually. Forget his name. Taylor Mallory, something like that. I would have to look it up. And he was in uh, command of the Air Forces. Now, how did they coordinate what was going to be the attack? Because there were so many different pieces. You've got the Air Force, paratroopers, boats landing with infantrymen. How did they coordinate this huge effort? Good preparation, essentially. Everything was rehearsed, all options were explored, and everybody had a specific task to do. So um, capturing the beaches was the job of, essentially, Montgomery. He was an overall command of all the land forces on D-Day. Uh, the shore bombardment was under the hands of uh, Admiral Ramsey. He was also responsible for making sure that all the ships with the landing craft would be able to go uh, towards the shore. And then the name I just uh, mentioned, uh, Trafford Lee Mallory, the Air Force commander, was in charge of making sure that there were no German aircraft around to prevent the invasion. And that was a job that had been going on for quite a few months prior to the invasion. There had been a large aerial campaign uh, on the Western Front with the intent of breaking the Luftwaffe. So they wanted complete air supremacy over Normandy when the invasion started. So as they're preparing for the invasion, you've got the British, you've got Americans, and you've got Canadians. How did these three different groups work together and how did they decide who was going to take which beach? That was decided on during conferences held prior to the invasion. So uh, the first idea was that there would be three landing beaches, but then uh, Eisenhower and Montgomery both insisted that there would become uh, five to have a bigger shore for uh, a ground uh, sooner. And then essentially they divided up the landing beaches. So the Americans got the two um, essentially on the right front, uh, right wing of the Allied front, the British would have two beaches and the Canadians would have one beach. Why did the Canadians have one beach? Did they have fewer troops? They had fewer troops, yeah. Okay. Yep. So the Americans took Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. Yes. The British took Sword Beach and Gold Beach. Yes. And the Canadians took Juno Beach. How did the beaches get their nicknames? Because that's not what they're called, obviously, by the French. No. That's a really good question. And uh, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Well, we'll save that. We'll figure that one out at another time. Okay. <laughs> what was it like on the Allied side the few days before, like right before the invasion? It must have been an extremely tense situation. The troops would have known what was going to happen. So uh, essentially all the troops that were involved with the invasion, they were sort of sealed off in their camps on the English shores. So they couldn't leave. They couldn't have contact with anybody else. Um, so to prevent any of the details falling into German hands, they were given their objectives. So they would be frantically trying to figure out what their roles were going to be, what the roles of their neighbors were going to be. And for the, the Allied High Command, it was a really tense situation because they they still hadn't figured out the exact date. The, the weather was really important. And the first suggestion for actual D-Day was the 5th of June. But the weather was too bad to go on that day. So... They were really just constantly muttering uh, the weather to find a good window to go over and uh, start the invasion. Now, when the invasion happened, what was the very first thing that happened for the invasion? Who were the first troops that went? Well, the first troops going in were the airborne forces. So on the American side, you had the 101st and 82nd Airborne Divisions. And on the British side, the 6th Airborne, they went in. And essentially, that was the first sign the Germans uh, noticed that the invasion was actually going to happen. So they were dropped around midnight on the, in the night between the 5th and the 6th of June. And that was the first sign the Germans had that, that was going to happen, something was going to happen. For those first airborne that they were paratroopers that came in, what was it like for them? Well, uh, very good question. It's... Um, 
the eighty second Airborne, they had some experience fighting in Italy, uh, fighting in Northern Africa as well. If I'm correct, I'm not sure if they were in Africa. I think they were. They must have been. But they were dropped at night, and there was a lot of German flak coming up, so anti-aircraft fire to trying to knock out the aircraft. And they were uh, scattered over a very large area, actually. So not, not many of them actually hit their designated drop zones. So they landed, um, other confusion. They had to try to find other members of their own unit and then trying to get their orientation and find a way to uh, achieve their objectives. Now, what was their objective? The American paratroopers, they were tasked with um, securing the exits of the causeways that led off from the beaches. So the landing forces, they had to capture the beaches themselves, but because uh, the area the Americans operated in was really marshy, there were only a few good roads that led off uh, the beaches and could support the enormous amount of traffic that was going to take place. And they were tasked with capturing and holding these important uh, causeways. The British, on the other hand, they were dropped further to the left flank of the Allies, and they were uh, tasked with capturing bridges over the Orne River and also some high ground overlooking the beaches that the English would use to land on. So some of the famous places that these paratroopers captured and took and landed were San Mariglis, which uh, was made famous by the Longest Day. Yes. Were one of the bridges that the British took the Pegasus Bridge? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I traveled with Liberation Route Europe in June, and I got to go to both of those places. They were really cool. Yes. Uh, San Mariglis was, they have a paratrooper on the church which is just really cool to see and to think about what it would have been like for thousands of paratroopers to be around. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened at saint mary Glees, because it's an interesting story. So saint mary Glees is a place that the 82nd Airborne, they landed near saint mary Glees, and as I said, it was part of their drop zone, and they then had to get their bearings and find a way uh, to capture the exits of the causeways that uh, the land forces landing on Uno, uh, Utah Beach were going to use. And tell us a little bit more about Johnny Steele, the paratrooper that landed on the church. Oh, I'm not really familiar with this story. Essentially, what you see from him in um, in The Longest Day, that's what made him famous. He <laughs> got his parachute stuck on a church tower, and he was dangling from it, trying not to be noticed by the Germans that were swarming all uh, below him. And, uh, well, he managed uh, to survive. I think he got free at some point and uh, landed quite rough, but I think he survived. Yeah, and some of the other paratroopers that landed in trees, the Germans would just come up and shoot them. So it was really a dangerous position to be in. You could land in trees, but the worst thing to happen for any of the paratroopers was to land in water. So there was a large marshy terrain, and if you landed in water with all the equipment you were carrying with you, it was very difficult to keep your head above water, quite literally. And that's how quite a few of them died. They landed and simply drowned. Oh my gosh, I don't think I realized that. No, but that was actually quite tragic because the high ground or the pieces of dry land, they are interspersed with so many uh, uh, marshes. And there are a lot of written accounts of uh, paratroopers landing in marshlands dipping over or falling on their back. And since it's really swampy, there's there's no way of getting yourself out again. And the amount of equipment they uh, took with them, that would weigh them down incredibly. What were the casualty rates like among the paratroopers? They were quite high, actually, but that's also because they weren't pulled back to Britain. The the idea was for them to actually achieve their D-Day objectives, so to make sure that they uh, held the uh, exits from the beaches. And then, you know, the, the, the general the idea was that they would fight for several days and then be pulled back to Britain to be put in reserve for another airborne action. But the German resistance proved so fierce that they stayed on. And they also, for instance, uh, helped in the capture of uh, Carentan, which was a bit to the south, which was an important road junction. And then essentially they stayed on for far longer than uh, anticipated. And that's the entire campaign took a lot of casualties from them. I'm not sure about the numbers, but at least a few thousand. So the paratroopers, when they initially landed on the 6th, were dropped behind the beaches. Let's go back to the beaches. What was it like to be there on the morning of June 6th? What were they experiencing? 
I wouldn't want to be there on the morning of June 6th, landing on one of those beaches, I can tell you. <laughs> it was absolutely horrible. Just absolutely insane. You have to imagine the shoreline was targeted by heavy artillery further inland. There were pillboxes, there were machine guns, there were anti-tank emplacements, barbed wire, mines, German infantrymen everywhere. It's just... It's absolutely insane. People actually went into those boats knowing that they were going to be the first waves landing on those beaches. It boggles belief. So the actual situation which they encountered differed from beach to beach. Omaha was by far the worst uh, of the beaches to land on. But on all the beaches, the many casualties took place before they could overcome the German defenses. Okay, so they sent them across in ships and then they got out and they got into smaller boats and then the boats landed. What were they facing from the Germans when they actually got out of the boats? Oh, everything. You have to imagine the, the shoreline had been uh, prepared for, to counter an invasion. So there were obstacles, first of all, in the water, trying to sink the boats before they could reach the shore. There were anti-tank obstacles, minefields, uh, barbed wire entanglements. And that's just the obstacles. Then you get uh, the Germans who command the high ground, the dunes, essentially. And they are firing down with mortars, with machine guns, with rifles. And then there's heavy artillery further inland. And that's also used to target uh, the beaches. So what made Omaha worse, even though all of them were terrible? Omaha was worse because the German defenders there were from a a division that was actually really up for their task. Some of the beaches were covered by static uh, divisions, which essentially meant that they were either really old men or young men, but they weren't really veterans of any campaign. They were just there to man static defenses. That is as far as their military use went. Omaha had uh, a division of infantry there, which was superior to the other beaches. But also uh, when the Americans landed, many of their uh, duplex drive tanks, so the tanks that could cross uh, water because they had an inflatable skirt, Many of them didn't beach the beaches. Um, The bombardment by the uh, Navy hadn't been as effective at other locations, despite the fact that it was an incredible bombardment to start off with. But the defenses remained relatively intact. And all those factors put together made for an absolutely uh, horrific experience for the Allies. Let's talk a little bit about Pont du Hoc, because I was not a Normandy history buff before I got to Normandy. And I knew about the beaches, but I didn't know as much as I thought I did. <laughs> but I didn't really know anything about Pont du Hoc. And it is, the feats that, that the soldiers had to go through there was just incredible. So why don't you tell our listeners what, first of all, what it is and what they had to do there. Well, Pont du Hoc is a large cliff in Normandy that is in the middle of Utah and Omaha Beach. So it's a cliff that overlooks both uh, the American landing beaches in Normandy And what the Germans had done there was build massive gun emplacements. The importance of Point du Hoc was that if you don't capture it, the Germans have an ideal firing position to uh, overlook both the American beaches. And that's why it had to be captured quickly. That was one of the main jobs the Americans faced, to capture Point du Hoc. To capture it, what did they have to do? Point du Hoc is, is a cliff, so it's a massive rock face that just rises up out of the ocean. The job was given to a ranger battalion, so sort of uh, special troops within the U.S. Army to scale the cliffs, first of all. So they used, used ladders, they used uh, ropes tied on anchors that were fired up the cliff with using mortars to get up there. So they first of all, their first job was to scale the cliff while under German fire, which is absolutely a horrible job to have. When they were actually on top of the cliff, they would have to uh, defeat the German garrison and disable the guns that they thought uh, were located there because in actual reality that the large guns had been removed from the sites at Point du Hoc. So they'd been removed and were there decoys there? The emplacements were still there and the Germans camouflaged the entire area, of course, and there were still pillboxes and machine gun posts and uh, quite a few other fortifications at Point du Hoc. But the, the bigger guns, they had been removed, and I'm not sure why that was. I'm, I, I'm not really sure on it, but I think it might have been due to the fact that they wanted to prevent them from being bombed or uh, hit by artillery from the Navy, and that they would be put in place at some point uh, just prior to the invasion. But again, I'm not sure, and it, uh, when the invasion took place, they weren't really there. They were in a ditch not too far away from uh, 
the actual site. But still, the, the, the capture of the of Point York was really important because the Germans could still overlook both beaches from it. So the, the, the Ranger Battalion did an absolutely incredible job in uh, securing it. What was it like for the Canadians at Juno Beach? Because that's a story that I really hadn't heard before. It wasn't really too different from the American uh, landings on Utah. Omaha, as we said, it's the Omaha was the worst beach to, to land on. But in the Canadian and British sectors, the defenses were uh, quite strong. So coming ashore was still a very deadly event. As soon as the, the, the British and Canadians landed on their beaches, they, they poured out of the assault craft onto the beaches. And again, the, the, the regular obstacles, the mines, the barbed wire, uh, the German pillboxes, machine gun emplacements, artillery opened up. And uh, there were heavy casualties as well trying to get off those beaches too. How long did it take for the Allies to secure the beaches themselves? Well, that's a good question. It, it really depends on what you see as the beaches. So the, the defenses stretched quite a bit inland from the beaches. So the actual sandy part, uh, for lack of a better term, of the beaches up towards the dunes, in most cases, those were, those were captured within a couple of hours. Omaha being the large exception, still Germans were still holding out a day after D-Day on the 7th of June in their positions at uh, Omaha. And there were several locations near the beaches or connected to the beaches that held out for quite a bit longer than the general defense line. What was it that allowed the Allies to take the beaches? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> As I said, if you go back in history, there's a few places you uh, want to be less than in an assault craft on uh, D-Day in the first wave. So the individual bravery of the Allied soldiers capturing the beaches, that's the paramount. But a lot of events preceded the actual landing. So um, one of the, the key features was the Allied air campaign, which took place months, uh, months before the actual landings took place. So the fact that they uh, knocked out essentially the Luftwaffe and that they had total air supremacy meant that there were no uh, fighters or bombers attacking the landing forces, which was vital. Then the uh, naval uh, barrage that took place hours before the landing. Uh, so the, the big guns of the battleships and cruisers and destroyers, uh, rockets uh, launched, a lot of rockets launched from ships, aimed at the German defenses. That was absolutely vital. If that hadn't been done, the casualties would have been far, far higher. And then there's smaller things like the special landing craft that had been developed. It's quite well known. They're called the Funnies. So all sorts of adaptions of tanks uh, used to clear the beach defenses, flail tanks, flamethrower tanks, um, anything you can uh, think of. And in a bigger sense, again, you can also think of the the Allied deceptions. So the idea that they uh, would not invade Normandy, but would either go for the Pas de Calais or the Dutch coast or the Scandinavian coast, so they, they essentially kept the Germans completely off balance prior to the landings, which meant that they hadn't, didn't have the opportunity to combine all their uh, forces to oppose the landings. Those were all really vital. Now, after the invasion, how long until they had secured kind of the region? They managed to uh, form one continuous beachhead between the 7th and 8th of June. So two days to sort of like link up all the the, the footholds they had uh, achieved on D-Day. And then the real battle for Normandy started, essentially. Um, One of the the, the biggest issues they faced was uh, moving through Normandy, which turned out to be an absolute hellish experience again for the Allied soldiers. If I'm remembering this right, they anticipated that it would take much less time to secure the actual surrounding area, correct? Yes, they thought that the, the actual landings would be the deadliest and most costly event and that then things would gradually start to calm down. But the Germans put up an incredible defense in Normandy. Now, after they took the beaches, the beaches were a staging area for the invasion. How were the beaches exactly used to support the rest of the invasion? Well, the beaches were used as a harbor location. So in the first instances, amphibious vehicles would go back and forth between the the main Allied fleet and the beaches to peddle in ammunition, food, supplies, anything you can imagine, fuel. And then um, just after the invasion, uh, they built two artificial harbors in the American and British sectors called Mulberries. And these were 
complete harbors that had been dragged across the chan- channel, sorry, and put in place in Normandy because the, the Allies essentially lacked any harbor facilities that were big enough to bring in enough supplies for the, their massive army. So they had to bring the harbors themselves. So that's why people thought they were going to land at Calais too, right? Calais had the harbor? Yes. It would have been an easier option in that sense. Of course, in Normandy, there's Cherbourg, the the big harbor, which was also one of the main objectives for the Americans. But the fact was that they couldn't count on quickly, uh, quickly capturing it. So they had to have something that could be used in any case. Yeah, I think I remember because I, I was in Cherbourg too. And I think I remember that it took three weeks to get from the beaches to Cherbourg, which is like maybe a 45 minute drive or something like and that. And then again, before the Germans surrendered at Cherbourg, they completely destroyed the harbor. So there was a, an American engineer unit who said that it was the finest job of destruction you could ever uh, you could ever imagine. They sunk ships, they placed mines, they blew up the docks, they dropped the cranes into the water. It was absolutely uh, devastated, entirely destroyed. I think it took them somewhere until in the middle of September before they actually could use Cherbourg in a limited uh, sense as a harbor. Oh, wow. Did they then have to use the harbors that they had built much longer than they had anticipated? Well, that's another story. The harbors they uh, brought with them, there were two of them. And the one in the American sector was completely destroyed in a storm on the 19th of June. Oh. Which which just left them with the one at Orange in the, the British sector. And that was then the, the main harbor they used for an extremely long period of time, considering the amount of uh, troops they had on, uh, on the, the continent. But I could be wrong in this. I think before Cherbourg was properly in action as the big port, they had actually already captured Antwerp. Not that they could use Antwerp at that time, but because they had to do another battle of the Scheldt before they could bring Antwerp into use. But it took them forever to clear it from all the rubble and destruction that the Germans had caused. Oh, wow. That is one thing I don't think about enough when I think about the history of warfare is the supplies and that side of it is often, you know, just as much a factor in the ultimate outcome (laughs) and what people are thinking. That was vital. The supply situation is what brought the Americans to their, uh, the Allies to their knees in early September. Once they finally managed to destroy the German army in Normandy, the advance they did was astonishing. They you have to imagine they spent more than two months getting out of Normandy, and then within two weeks they were on the Dutch-Belgian border after they had uh, managed to destroy the German armies. And then the, the the supply situation simply collapsed. They couldn't do it. There was no way to get everything from still from the landing beaches up towards the front line because the distance was growing by each day. So that's what stopped them in September. Not much, not much else. Now after. They've moved on, and the front line is in Belgium and is in the Netherlands. What was happening at the beaches in Normandy? It was still a, a high of activity because that was the main supply base for the entire Allied invasion. All the supplies, you have to imagine every bullet, each gallon of fuel that, uh, that the troops needed was coming in via the beaches in Normandy. That's the thing that really made me think about how little I understand about some of these things is you're taking these beaches not just because it's a good strategic place for a battle, but because it's also a good strategic place for the supplies and, and a place to stage the rest of the war. And just the amount of knowledge and manpower and everything that went into that decision and then actually taking it, like my brain can't even comprehend all of the work and sacrifice that it took for them to do that. And I'm a little bit afraid that if something like that was needed today, who would be the people that did it? You know what I mean? Yeah, the the supply situation was one of the most difficult aspects of the entire operation because there's a the only connection you have is via the channel, and if you want to bring in big ships which can do big amounts uh, of uh, trafficking, you need a big harbor. It's as simple as that, and the only thing they had was a sort of improvised one at Armanche for quite a long time, and even when they passed certain of the harbors on the the western coast of Europe, the the Germans were ordered to hold these harbors until the very last man. So if you look at a a map of Europe in, let's say, early September 1944, you'll see that the the front line has moved on, but the harbors on the coast are still actually, most of them are still in German hands. They were garrisoned and they were told not to leave the uh, fortifications. Oh, wow. So what was the relationship like between the French on the ground and the Allied troops as they were coming in? Well, the the Allies were obviously very welcome uh, to come in. 
But I think that many of the, the, the French people living in Normandy or in like cities like Caen, for instance, they were disappointed in the fact that the Allies were quite close, but the liberation took, for, for instance, for Caen, took six weeks. And basically the entire city had been bombed to ashes. There was nothing left. And the same goes for many of the smaller villages near Caen, near the American sector, near Cherbourg, near all the, the big battlefields. The, the destruction was, of course, if you fight for two months with two big opposing armies, uh, using artillery bombardments, using uh, bombings by aircraft, the, the destruction was enormous. So on the one hand, they would be happy to be liberated. But on the other hand, they would be, I expect, very sad to see that much of the countryside was being destroyed. Many people were dying, civilians included. So, yeah, mixed feelings, I suppose. Yeah, that word liberation is really heavy just because on the Allied side, I think a lot of Westerners understand that the liberation by the Red Army, especially if you were in Eastern Europe, was not necessarily freedom, even though the word is still liberation. And I I think I forget that in Western Europe, just because people were liberated did not mean that they ha- they were not still suffering and that didn't come with some amount of terror. Because like, for example, my grandfather, he was part of D-Day. He was a bomber for the Americans. So he bombed like 30, he did like 35 bombing raids. So in each one of them, he's doing work to free people, but he's also bombing people, you know, the people that he's trying to free in a lot of situations. So it's just a lot to think about. That's the reality of war, essentially. It's not a happy thing. It's not a uh, heroic thing. It's just pure destruction, and people lose their lives on a daily basis, civilians, soldiers alike. And the thing you said about the word liberation is really interesting, because I think, uh, from a historical point of view, if you look at the liberation route, the route runs through, I think it's now seven countries at the moment, Poland in Eastern Europe, the arrival of the Red Army was seen as anything but a liberation, of course. They were just occupied by another regime. For Germany, it's the big, it's a big question as well. The Allied armies came, and they overthrew the Nazis, but did the population experienced that as a liberation. At the time, I don't think they did. Later on, they started to equate the arrival of the Allies with the liberation, because then too, they too, in at least Western Germany, they had a democratically elected free government after the war. In Eastern Germany, it was a different matter, of course, with the Soviets being in control. But also, if you were in France or Belgium or the Netherlands, if there was a big battle in your uh, hometown, the destruction would just be ranging from quite light to not one brick standing on top of the other anymore like it was in Cannes. It's, you know, it's mixed feelings. Oh, wow. What was it like in Normandy after the war? I know there was a camp of German POWs, but what was it like for Normandy to reconcile with what had happened there? Well, immediately after the war, the main focus would have been to get things up and running again, of course. You know, a lot of destructions had taken place. Many of the cities were completely destroyed. People needed housing. People needed food. So that was the primary concern just after. And then slowly, you know, they started building again. They started getting back to the level just prior to the war. And then, of course, also quite soon, uh, commemorations started to take place in Normandy because it was so heavily thought over. It's the, the beginning of the liberation of Western Europe. It's such a significant site. The cemeteries were there. Quite quickly, museums were also established to tell the stories of the, the landing beaches and the Battle for Normandy itself. And I think if you look at Western Europe at our current time, there's not a single place in Western Europe that is so heavily involved still with its own Second World War history as Normandy. There are so many amazing museums to visit. There are so many historical locations simply because they took two months to get through what was essentially a very small location. So every street, every village, every corner almost has an amazing story to tell. When I was there, one, I do a lot of press trips that are based around historical events that are important. So it's rare for me to go on a press trip and not cry. But I don't usually find so many people crying with me. And uh, we were there actually on the anniversary of D-Day. But I was shocked by the number of places that we could go and find people celebrating, commiserating veterans. Every place we went just seemed incredibly special. The museums were top-notch, like... I can't imagine a place that is more 
responsible about celebrating their history and inviting the people who took place in that history to come back. I mean, it was just amazing. And yeah, every every church, every place was had its own story and knew that story and wanted to make sure you knew their story too. I mean, it was just incredible. Yeah, and it's, it's like I said, because of the fact that it took them the best part of three months to actually clear Normandy. And then you have to imagine that the rest of northern France, they passed within weeks. Like I said, they were at the Dutch, uh, Dutch-Belgian Dutch border within two weeks. And the intensity of the fighting in Normandy is just unbelievable. Uh, like I said, every small village, every hill, every uh, high embankment, every river, everything was fought over. So it's so rich in history. Yeah. Now, let's talk a little bit about what is there today, because I know that a lot of our listeners are probably intrigued and think this is someplace they might want to see. So, for example, there all five beaches are still, like, there are things you can do at all five beaches to learn and to commemorate. Um, and then there are lots of little other towns and things. But what would you recommend somebody do first? What I would recommend to do first is visit the beaches, the place that the entire history started in. Just have a look at the, the beaches themselves. So if you're in the American sector, either Utah or Omaha, or Sword Gold or Juno in the British Canadian sector, have a look at the, the location itself. And then there's so many locations to choose from. The Juno Beach Museum in the Canadian sector is really good. I've been there. Oh, it was so good. Especially as an American, I had no concept of what Canada's role in World War II was. So, and I think a lot of Americans, my show is a lot of our listeners are Americans. I think a lot of Americans might not think I should go to the Canadian center, but the Juneau Beach Center is just excellent and, and well worth an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah, it really is. Um, there's a great visitor center near Omaha Beach, basically on the, the American Cemetery, which, which is also a place you should really visit which overlooks the landing beaches. The, the, there's a new visitor center, which has been opened. I'm not sure when it was actually opened, a few years ago. Absolutely a, a good place to go. saint mary Glise, the museum, is a wonderful place to go. Uh, in Cannes, the Memorial de Caen, is one of the biggest museums you can uh, visit in uh, Normandy, which is absolutely amazing. But there's places you could go everywhere. As I said, the history is so rich, so almost every location has a, a good museum you could visit. Uh, there's a nice one about the Polish uh, involvement in, um, God, I forget the place name, but there's a good museum on, on the Polish involvement in the, the Normandy battle as well. In Aromarsh, there is a beautiful museum. Aromarsh is also very cool because you can actually still see parts of the Mulberry Harbor out of shore if it's low tide. Yeah, <laughs> which was cool. I saw that on... Uh... Actually, it was on June 6th. It was like there that night. And I met some current Dutch soldiers who told me about some of the things that they had done, but then also how proud they were to have been part of different parts of D-Day with the Irene Brigade. And we cried. And I've never been to a place where I was so happy to be crying (laughs) with people. Yeah, such an emotional place too, like you say. So some of the other highlights I would say is definitely the Utah Beach Museum or the Utah Museum was fantastic because you go to Utah Beach, but then the museum's like on the beach. So you can experience the beach and then you can go in and see the museum. And that's really where I think the American story, it's like the Canadian story is at the Juneau Beach Center and the American story is really at the Utah Beach Museum. And then the Normandy American Cemetery, which you have to go to. And then one place that I hadn't ever thought I would end up and was so rewarding was the, uh, Lacam German yes. War Cemetery. I was just about to say that's something you should oh. also include in any trip you do. What was crazy is when we were there, there was actually a German soldier in his uniform being interviewed because obviously at the time of year we were there, people are coming back. And he was being interviewed, and you know, he moved to England after the war. He's been in England for 60 years, but and he was speaking in German, but still, just the fact that like I was in a German war cemetery and he was there was just very powerful. And and I think they've done a great job of not commemorating Nazism in any way, but making it very somber about these men. You know, there's 22,000 soldiers buried there and reconciliation is really kind of their mission now. Yeah. 
But it's it's a sensitive subject, of course, uh, the, to commemorate the German soldiers of the battle. But you have to imagine some of them were, they weren't all volunteers to start out with. Some were just conscripts that had to serve in the German army. And if you didn't, essentially, you would be shot for desertion. The Hitler Youth Division, the SS Division, one of the most fanatical units that you could find in Normandy. But again, those were young boys. At a young age, they were completely indoctrinated in Germany. They grew up in the Nazi state, and they were essentially raised to be soldiers. They knew nothing else. They knew nothing else than uh, Nazism. And they were uh, very actively indoctrinated. So, you know, these were guys 17, 18, even 16-year-olds, you know. So can you blame them? They they did commit war crimes in Normandy. So it's really, of course, it's not a beautiful history they have. But these were just young guys as well, you know. It's a very difficult subject, but I... I'm glad to see that we're slowly moving towards the fact that we can also commemorate those victims of the Second World War. You know, there were people in there which were completely, extremely um, devoted to the Nazi regime, who committed war crimes, who did heinous things, you know, and they they don't deserve to have their memory honored in the same way as the Allied soldiers. But there are also people who essentially perhaps didn't even want to be there or were so indoctrinated that they couldn't think of anything else to do, you know? So, yeah, difficult. Yeah, I, I've thought a lot about Lacan as obviously in the States we're having a discussion about Confederate monuments and I recently was in a Confederate cemetery in Alabama and I wish, I hope that America learns from how, more from how the war is looked at by Germany and how German organizations take care of their war dead. And that there's just a lot of lessons there because I didn't get for one second, a feeling of disrespect when I was there, Mm -hmm. you know, but at the same time, there wasn't like a Rommel statue. We weren't glorifying anything. We were simply commemorating and thinking about it. And there was a place for their family to go and lay flowers because, you know, some of these people still have, children, grandchildren that are, you know, alive and they deserve a place to go commemorate yep. their dead, but it wasn't um, a glorification in any way. So I just think there's, it's such a good place for, I think, Americans specifically to go and see how other cultures deal with things that we have similar things in our past. All credit to the German War Graves Commission. They do a absolutely excellent job of, as you said, it's a somber place. It's a place for reflection. It's a place to think about the past. And it's a place where relatives can come visit the graves of their forefathers. But it's not to glorify Nazism in any way. It's just, you know, these people were also there. They died. Some of them wanted to be there. Others didn't. You know, it's 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 really complex. And I was, um, I, I was shocked, too, at how going to Lacan, and seeing the German war graves and going to the Normandy American Cemetery and seeing the American war graves, how symmetrical and like right those things felt on the same trip, mm-hmm. you know? But I can't think Liberation Route Europe enough for just how much I learned by getting to travel with you all. And I really hope other people go and make the same trek because I left a better person. Good. Really nice to hear. <laughs> so let's uh, lighten it up a little bit. What would be uh, a place that somebody should go where they'll have a lot of fun because if they're on vacation and they want to learn where else would they go but that might be a little bit more fun than some of the cemetery i think juno beach is really aimed also at a younger audience so if you're a family with children juno beach would be a good one so Eric Lees, the large museum is really cool too they have the the big aircraft in the hangars but they also have a special sort of like segment in the main exhibition for children to follow so that's also if you're younger and you don't really fully grasp the history, there's a sort of guide situation. It's not an actual guide, but they have markers in each of the room for younger children, which really tell the history from a very simple uh, uh, level, which is amazing for kids to visit the beaches. I think I don't have children myself, but I imagine uh, some children would ima- uh, would like to uh, run along the beaches and you get a good sense <laughs> of the history too. Yeah, I don't have children either, but they seem to really enjoy... Like, lots of people, especially in June, are dressed up in vintage costumes, so either uh, military reenactment gear or a lot of the women are dressed up in just really beautiful dresses from the period. And there are also a lot of little kids dressed up in military costumes, and, you know, that's a really fun thing if you're a seven-year-old boy or girl to, like, get to do that on your vacation. (laughs) I think so, yeah. So... 
how can someone, if they're interested in learning more about Liberation Europe, why don't you tell us a little bit about the organization and how people can get in touch with you guys? Essentially, what we do is we follow the footsteps of the liberators of Western Europe and also, of course, like I said, in Poland, in, in Eastern Europe. And what the Liberation Route does is go to all the places the liberators have been and to uh, give some more information there. We have an incredible website. We have an incredible app. Uh, the website is www.liberationroute.com. All the information we have uh, is on there in five languages. It's in English, in French, uh, German, Dutch, Polish. You can have a look at it. Uh, you can build your own uh, itinerary in our app. If you're planning a visit, you can have a look at all the sites that you could possibly want to visit in Normandy, for instance. There's more background information. There's biographies on the people who were involved. Anything. Just go to our website. You can also go to the via our website. You can book trips to Normandy via tour operators who uh, do those. So there's a lot of uh, lot of options. Now the trips are. It's not like your organization. You guys are a tour company. You guys are a, a, like a nonprofit essentially. But you guys have relationships with tours that you guys have kind of blessed as being very historically accurate and very good. And if somebody wanted a recommendation for that, that's what they're looking at on your website, right? What we do is we try to keep the, the history alive. We have a website with all the information on it. And as you said, we're a nonprofit, so we're not looking to make any money out of it. But the tour operators who are on our website, they can, uh, they can provide you with a great service. You know, if you want to visit all the sites on your own, feel free to. It's really a good experience as well. But if you want to have, uh, you know, somebody picking you up in a bus, selecting hotels for you, and basically providing you with a complete package, you can also visit those via our website and then book with them. Perfect. Where can people find you on social media? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> just look for Liberation Route, I suppose. I'm just a, I'm just a simple historian. I know of the website, I know of the app, I know we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But I'm not really familiar with the account names. I'll just look up Liberation, but I'm sure you'll be able to find it quite quickly. All right, we'll put all the links to all of the social media in the show notes because I really enjoy your guys' social media accounts. You guys get out good information that history lovers would like, even if they're not able to get out there. So we'll put that on the show notes. Good. Um, well, Yuri, uh, thank you so much. I really honor that you came on the show, and I really appreciate you giving us your time today. You're more than welcome. I enjoyed it as well. I want to say thank you again to Yori for coming on the show and sharing his knowledge of both the D-Day invasion and how Europe experienced the liberation afterwards. Check out Liberation Route Europe's website in the show notes for tons of information on D-Day and the rest of the Allied liberation of Europe. For those who have subscribed to the show already, thank you. If you want more episodes, please subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. The show is now available on most platforms, such as Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, Acast, iTunes, etc. However, if there is a platform that you love and you don't see the show, let me know. Send me an email to stephanie at historyfangirl.com. Thank you so much to those of you who've taken time to read and review the show in iTunes. If you haven't yet and want to help the show out, it would be wonderful if you'd rate and review the show. Every review makes the show more visible in the iTunes store for new listeners to find, especially if you're a Irish, Canadian, or if you're from Great Britain, those reviews would be really helpful because we have reviews from each of those places, but we don't have enough to get a full-on rating. So you have to get five reviews from a country to get a rating. So in the United States, we've got lots of reviews, but Ireland, Canada, Great Britain, New Zealand, it would be really great if you listen to the show, if you could go in and rate it. This week's giveaway. The prize this week is a copy of Mike Duncan's The Storm Before the Storm. The book comes out this week on October 24th, so here's a chance to get your hands on a copy. All you have to do to enter is be a newsletter subscriber and leave a comment on the blog post for this episode, which the blog post is in the show notes. The contest closes at the same time every week, so an episode goes up on Monday and the giveaway always closes at midnight Eastern the following Sunday. I have some housekeeping to do for the last few episodes and letting the giveaway winners know, but there's a page on my website that has the giveaway winners posted after I select it. And I haven't had a lot of entries every week, so there's hundreds and hundreds of you guys downloading the show every week, which I'm really happy about two months in, but not a ton of entries for the contest every week. So there's definitely an opportunity. If you want to win a copy of the show, go to the blog post, 
and subscribe to the newsletter and leave a comment. It can be what you thought of this episode. It can be a comment about a place you'd want me to cover for another episode in the future. You know, just whatever's on your mind, let me know. And as far as the contest goes, good luck.